If somebody were to follow my pricing model, but were on, was only operating out of their garage as a solo operator, they might price themselves out of jobs. They don't need to cover overhead like I need to cover overhead. That kind of translates in how we calculate our pricing is we ultimately find you know what our overhead pricing is, what our variable costs are going to be on that property, and then we can add a profit margin on top of that. Ultimately, we want to figure out what our hourly rate is to the customer. Price to the customer is dependent. The hourly rate is a very Variable, but the production rates are always a constant. Today, we are going to hear the story of Sam Gustin. He is outside of Austin, Texas, the Texas Longhorn country down there. And uh, he spoke at Mike Andy's conference uh, a while back, and uh, he's built an incredible landscaping business. So without further ado, welcome to the Green Industry Podcast, Sam. Hey, Paul. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm beyond honored. Uh, if my wife had had to report back, she would, she would just say how excited I've been over the past few days. So I'm very excited to be here speaking with you. Cool. Well, we love to dive into entrepreneur stories and uh, really the the lessons that you learn uh, in, in, in growing your business and everything like that. So uh, before we get into your humble beginnings and, and the growth phases of your business, Sam, tell us a little bit about where you guys are now, um, who your customers are and, and what your business looks like in 2024. Yeah. So currently uh, we're, we're on pace to hit a million dollars in sales in this 2024 season. Uh, we just opened up our second location March of this year and cumulatively between the two locations, um, we're, we'll hit that a million dollar mark. And it's we're in our fourth year of business. And so it's been fast growth uh, ever since 2020. And we have 11 employees in total that includes myself. And we, we ultimately just try to keep things as simple as possible. We focus on three services right now. We're kind of phasing out a fourth service at the moment. Um, but the, the whole idea here is to keep it super simple and standardized so that way uh, we can bring people on, train them up and ultimately have them be profitable, you know, within a 10 day training. Period. What, what are the three services, Sam? So our, our bread and butter is lawn mowing. I, last time I pulled a report, we're at like 76% of our revenue is lawn mowing. I tell people all the time we make tall grass short and we're the best at it. Uh, we just started getting into weed control and fertilizer. I just got licensed back in June. And so we sent out a mass text to all of our contacts, uh, got 60 customers, you know, relatively overnight. And so we're learning that side of things. Uh, but that's going to be a big, uh, big component within like our three year vision is getting that um, weed control and fertilizer up to about 800,000 and sustain that over the next three years. And then um, the third service is the flower bed cleanups, just mulch replenishment, bush trimming. Okay. So I got lawn mowing, furt and squirt, and then, and then bed, bed cleanups. We got 11 guys or gals, I don't know. And then uh, we got a projected of a million dollars uh, in revenue. What caused you, Sam, to want to wanna be a landscaping business owner? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I did six years in, in the United States Army and I, I planned on doing plenty more, but my wife with my job in the army, I didn't really have a job in America. So she was kind of like, you got to get out. Um, so right after that, I started, you know, developing my sales skills and, and started a career in sales. And ultimately I got baptized in 2021 uh, on Easter Sunday. And that following Monday, uh, somebody approached me and, and kind of just said, God wants you to go full time with whatever's making you the least amount of money. Cause I was making decent money in sales at that point. And I might've been mowing like less than 10 people. And so I just kind of, you know, prayed about it, jumped in full time and God's had his hand on our business for, uh, for the past four years. And so. Uh, even at the Mike Andy's conference when I was speaking about it, it was hard to take full credit and just kind of being like, you know, God's God's blessed us. And uh, it's kind of where where I stand in, in terms of all that. Cool. Well, thank you for your service. Oh, thank you. In regards to uh, your business with these 11 employees in a, in a million dollar mark, uh, what does that look like for you? What, what are you doing on a day in and day out basis? How many crews do you have? What, what's kind of like the, the breakdown of, of a day? in the life of your uh, lawn business? Yeah, so for our main location, we have three crews and we have like a, a operating general manager where they are doing just enough budgeted hours to basically pay for their salary. And ultimately their their main focus is to sustain, a rel it's an 800,000 a year company, our location. And so their job is to cover their salary with revenue generating tasks and making sure all the guys get all their work done and just maintaining culture. For our second location, uh, we have two employees over there. One's a general manager. And ultimately my job now is to make sure that our office manager has all the resources necessary, um, has the policies and understands our mission, vision, where we're going. And ultimately I like to consider myself at this point more of like a strategist and making sure that our vision is dialed in and 
providing the correct employees with the correct resources to make sure that we can ultimately you know, accomplish that mission. So if I had to really put a pinpoint on it, it'd be sales strategy and just making sure everybody's going in the right direction. A million dollars a year is a lot of money. How, how many customers do you have? That's a lot of grass you're cutting. If that's 76% of your, your revenue, um, you guys have a high volume uh, business. What's your customer count at? So our main location, we're about 420. Our second location, we're at 100. Um, and I was doing the math. I think we're doing, I think it was like 1,200 lawns a month. Um, wow. It's kind of what we're doing at the moment. That's a lot. So the grass there in Austin, I've, I, I was telling you off air, I've never been there. Um, so I don't, I don't know what kind of turf you guys have and how, how frequent it grows or if it's so hot in the summer, I'd imagine it doesn't grow that much. Yeah, similar to probably what you were used to when you first started, Paul, in Atlanta. Is, uh, we have Bermuda is the majority of our lawns. And uh, we, you know, St. Augustine is kind of sprinkled in there as well. Uh, but ultimately, we do a biweekly service, uh, basically from March through Thanksgiving. And then in the winter, we switch over to what we call winter services. And we, instead of coming there once every two weeks, uh, we'll raise our prices by 30%, but only come there once a month. That way, our price per service is increased. Ultimately, it's a saving to the customer on a monthly basis. And it allows to keep our employees um, relatively busy so that we can retain that top talent. Yeah, that's fantastic. So when are you sending out the, the invoices? Are you billing them every two weeks, like the day you do the service? Are you billing them differently? What what have you found works best for, for the billing? I think for uh, just to make sure that we don't like miss anything, we do, we do invoices within 24 hours of the service completion. Uh, we have card on file for all of our customers. So as soon as right. they're um, as soon as their invoice or service is finished, it automatically generates an invoice and our office manager that next morning will come in and do all invoicing within 24 hours. So basically per service, you're, you're, you're billing. And then what uh, CRM do you all use? We used to use Jobber, um, but now we are using Copilot CRM that's uh, with Mike Andes. We love Jobber. Um, it's just, I think we outgrew it. It's tough to uh, manage a million dollar company with, with that software only due to lack of automations and like third party support with Zapier. Um, but currently we're using Copilot. Okay, fantastic. And then how do you do your payroll and, and things of that nature? Like how often are you paying your team and, and, and what does that kind of look like? So in terms of how our guys are paid, Paul, uh, we are utilizing that Mike Andy's P4P software. So for anybody listening that's not familiar, ultimately our guys get 33% share of the labor revenue that they bring into the company it, it aligns their and or their pay in their uh it aligns their pay with how i get paid so the more money they make for the company the more money they make individually we pay them every two weeks i get paid every two weeks um and our general managers are salary office manager is hourly and then uh myself is salary and all of our employees are p for p and what kind of uh payroll company or, or how, how do you have that set up uh, you guys have a specific company you outsource that to, or? So we, we do all payroll in-house. Uh, I think it's pretty simple. I, I do it myself. It maybe takes me 10 minutes every two weeks to really get payroll uh, ran. We use a company called Gusto uh, to help with our payroll. We've used Gusto since day one and I haven't had any complaints. And so I'm not, I guess I'm not looking out, outsource. I'm not looking out uh, to move out of Gusto at all, but um, we, we systematize payroll. So it's relatively pretty straightforward. It doesn't take a whole lot of time. Okay. And then with these 420 customers in your, your, your main location, what kind of route density do you have with that, Sam? And like, how did you kind of accumulate, you know, hundreds of customers? That's a lot. Mm -hmm. How did you kind of go about uh, getting that service area there outside of Austin? So right now uh, we probably have like a, our, our dashboard, we have like a 3.1 mile radius for our customers. Uh, we are kind of being loose with that intentionally paul so that way when we want to open up we're opening up our third location in the spring so we want to start kind of marketing towards that new service area ultimately it's only like a 15 minute drive away from the current service area we're in but once those customers are handed off to the general manager for that third location our we'll refill those customers and we'll probably be within two and a half three mile radius for for one location wow that that's super uh tight now with your uh, equipment or shop or like what, what's kind of headquarters for you guys? And, and, and I'm sure you didn't start where you're at now. Like, how did you start? And then what does it look like now? Yeah. So started out of, <laughs> I started out of the back of my wife's 2011 Ford Focus. Nice. Um, folded a mower in the back of her trunk. Oh. And ultimately I, I picked up a few more lawns just so I could get a truck and justify having a truck. That's how this whole thing started. But after it kind of started becoming a full-time thing, I moved out of our garage into just a cheap storage unit. 
um, since we, we basically bounced and upgraded storage units until we got the shop space that we're in currently. Uh, we have three total offices, one we're subleasing out, and then we have like a main warehouse shop space directly below where I'm sitting. And then we have a whole back like gravel lot that all of our uh, mowers are parked in. We have like a lean to area and then we pay for enough parking spots for all of our employees to park. Cool. The two most com- frequently asked questions I get are how much should I charge? Meaning like what, what should my prices be and how do you find and keep good employees? Those are kind of the two in a roundabout way. People are always asking me the same questions. What, how, how would you answer those questions? What, what do you charge and why? And then we will get into the employees in a minute, but let's, let's start with the pricing. I really want to pick your brain on, on how you come up with your prices for, for these customers. Sure. So th- as you're aware, Paul, that's, that's a, a broad question and I could go quite a few different ways here. Ultimately, my one piece of advice would be take others advice of pricing with caution because their business is different than your business. If somebody were to follow my pricing model, but were on, was only operating out of their garage as a solo operator, they might price themselves out of jobs because they don't they don't need to cover overhead like I need to cover overhead. That kind of translates in how we calculate our pricing is we ultimately find you know what our overhead pricing is, what our variable costs are gonna be on that property, and then we can add a pro, like our profit margin on top of that. Ultimately, we wanna figure out what our hourly rate is to the customer, and we want to make sure that we have dialed in data on how long it takes us to mow X amount of square feet. Price to the customer is um, is dependent. The hourly rate is a variable, but the production rates are always a constant. And so those three uh, components are ultimately going to make up your price to a customer is how fast can you mow X amount of square feet? What's your hourly rate that you're charging them? And then in relation to like a decimal point, and we call them budgeted hours, or you can call them billable hours. What is that? What is that price to the customer based on those three variables? Very well said. So, just most of the guys that listen to our podcast, Sam, are between fifty to to two hundred and fifty revenue um, with just one crew, and so and they're just starting out. They're they're in year one. They're in year two. They're in year three. Uh, what what's your advice for them? Like a real number? Like what what should be an hourly rate? Let's say they're just working by themselves and they're going to go out there and they're going to mow for about 45 minutes and then clean up with the weed eater a little bit and blow. And it's going to be an hour, you know, when it's all said and done, it's a flat hour. They're just working by themselves. They don't have huge overhead. What, what, what would you recommend they charge per man hour? If, if you do not have like a lifestyle where you have to go out and spend a whole bunch of money, you can basically just name your take home hourly rate. So if you're going to go out there for an hour, typically what we, we see is gas is like a 3%. Um, expense on our profit and loss in relation to our revenue. So take away three per, or I guess add three percent to how much you want to pay yourself per hour, and then you're going to have credit card processing fees if you're doing it correctly. Let's say that's another three and a half percent, just for worst case scenario. So add three and a half percent to that, um, and then if you have any overhead expenses, and so if you have if you're just operating out of your garage, all your equipment's paid off, trucks paid off, you're going to be extremely profitable. So if you want to make uh, you know, $40 an hour that you're out mowing lawns and you're going to commit 40 hours a week to doing that, just make sure that you're adding your expenses on top of $40 per hour. I personally, we do a lot of different coaching calls as well, Paul, and a standard hourly rate that we're seeing across, across the country is around like $75 to $85 per man hour on a property. Uh, our company, we're, we're well above that. But if you're just getting started, I see too often people underprice their services. Um, ultimately, people are calling you to get their lawn mowed. The quality of lawn mowing from our company compared to the same person doing it by themselves, they're, they might be better than us. It's just what kind of brand did we put out there? But ultimately, quality is going to be relatively the same. It's a simple service. So do not underprice your services. I would say do no less than, let's say, $70 per man hour as a labor rate. Okay. So we have, um, if you guys are listening and you want, this is my research. I mean, and it, it's not tight and perfect, but I just, I've done over a thousand of these episodes, you know, interviews. And I just ask everybody usually whether they're from Austin or, or New Jersey or California or Texas, what do you charge per man hour? And I've just, I've collected the data over the years. Uh, you're right spot on in the middle, Sam. But anyway, we put together a, a document. It's completely free. I put I threw it up on my website. It's the pri- uh, ultimate pricing guide. So what I did is I put like, if you're in Arkansas, 
you know, folks are charging $60 per man hour. If you're in, you know, Los Angeles, it's $120 per man hour, or New York and, and everything like that. I have all different Florida, Georgia, and different regions, what I'm hearing folks are charging. Um, but that $75, $85 per man hour for someone just getting started, I, I think you're going to do really well if you can have the confidence to charge that. Because like you said, Sam, most guys... If a, if a yard takes an hour to mow, edge, trim, and blow, they don't have the courage to 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 look their customer in the face and say that'll be seventy five dollars. They they just don't. What what would you say to that person that's like seventy five dollars for one yard for one hour? I can't charge that. Oh, I can't charge that, Sam. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I would I first want to address the limiting belief of the business owner is the best advice that I've received is I am not my own customer. I enjoy getting out and mowing a lawn. So if somebody came to me and said $75 for a lawn mowing services, I would be like, get off my property. But I'm not my customer. There's plenty of people that pay us over $75 per hour to mow along. So for the business owner, just understand that you are not your customer. And then just let the customer tell you no. Don't tell yourself no on behalf of the customer would be my advice. Now, overcoming pricing ultimately just comes down to we have to understand why people say no to pricing in the first place. The, the perceived value is lower than the price that you're giving the customer. So there's two ways that you can get a yes there. You can lower the price or you can raise the perceived value. And ultimately how you do, how you increase perceived value is you follow up with an estimate. Not a lot of lawn care companies take the time to give somebody a call two days after they send out an estimate. Follow up, talk with a smile on the phone, have branded trucks or at least, a, at least some sort of logo or magnet on your truck so they know who's showing up to your property. If you have one or two employees, make sure you guys are all wearing the same uniforms. All this is going, and also one more thing is, whatever branding is on your truck, make sure it's the same branding on the website. Make sure it's the same branding on your Google page, the same branding on your door hangers, because all of this is gonna raise the perceived value, ultimately allowing to fewer people to say no to pricing. So pricing is never something that we negotiate. Well, we can negotiate, um, anything else but we don't we don't touch on pricing because we know the value that we offer and i'm not going to accept anything less for my my employees very well said what was your guys' net profit um last year per percentage wise uh for your business so last year we were still in hyper growth mode i believe we we're at like 11 percent net uh this year uh specifically looking at our may profit and loss statement we're at like a 26 percent net um for our, for our main location my main goal is to get each location up to 800,000 a year in profit with 30% net profit or 800,000 a year in top line. I wish 800,000 a year in profit, 800,000 a year in top line with about a 30% net profit is what I'm you know, trying to build towards. But right now we're sitting uh, around 26% uh, for the year. Okay. And you mentioned um, door hangers earlier. Is that something that you do um, to tell us a little bit about where you buy those, how you get them on the doors, um, what obstacles you faced in, in getting those out there in, in 2024? Great question. So we use Vistaprint. I design everything myself in Canva, and then we order them through Vistaprint. The more you order, the cheaper it is per flyer. Uh, we, in the sl very slow season in February, we try to hire people and get them onboarded, and then there's not going to be a whole lot of lawns to be serviced. So we try to get them out doing door hangers, um, try to get the flyers out as fast as possible. Now, once we start picking up lawns, we hire like high school kids paying 15 bucks an hour, ask them to go do 80 to 100 flyers per hour, be out there for eight days or eight hours a day. And we bake those labor costs into you know our hourly cost that it takes us to get a flyer out. And ultimately what we try to do is we try to figure out out of every 100 flyers that we hand out, how many customers do we get? We can run those numbers with how much it costs us per hour and that'll get us our customer acquisition cost on door hangers. Some of the, um, how we follow that is we, we tell all of our employees, do not walk across the lawn, make sure you go driveway, sidewalk to driveway. People get pretty upset if you walk on lawns, but we found out. Also, get off my grass. <laughs> seriously, get I'm, like, off my grass. I'm just trying to mow the grass, sir. I'm gonna have to be on it if you hire me anyways. Um, but people get upset with that. So we tell our guys all the time to walk driveway, sidewalk, driveway. And then um, we, we've we ignored the no solicitor sign this spring and we've gotten a few one-star reviews for that. So that was a lesson learned. Uh, apparently we were leaving trash on people's property. And so that was a lesson learned. 
but we should have we should have followed the no solicitation sign. Ultimately, the way to get around that is just do every door direct mail because there's you, you can't you, you get past the no solicitation sign every single time with every door direct mail. But we ultimately see higher conversion rates on door hangers. You guys are um, crushing it on the Google business profile. Um, I think you have over 200 reviews over there, 4.9 or something stars. Uh, what, what's been your strategy to, to really beef up your, your presence on Google and, and how in the world did you get over 200? I know you said you had a couple one stars, but those are few and far between. How did you get so many five stars uh, and, and, and really have such a good reputation on Google? Yeah, ultimately we prioritize uh, relationships with customers. And so if, uh, if you can make somebody happy and they're visibly happy after their interaction with you, I always just asked for a review. So that was my strategy for the first hundred reviews was just be myself, put a smile on people's faces and just ask for a five-star review. I, I've seen people just be like, hey, can you leave us an honest review? I'm like, no, I'm specifically asking you for a five-star. Like I'm giving you the recipe for success. Since then, we've kind of developed two different strategies that we've used to get five-star reviews. Um, when a customer cancels with us now, we send them a cancellation form. And on the bottom of that cancellation form, they have an option to leave a one through a five-star rating. If they leave a one through a three-star rating, we ultimately send them to a thank you page saying, thank you for your feedback. We will like be sure to get better at whatever our deficiency was. If they send us a four-star rating or a five-star rating, it is going to direct them directly to our Google business page directly after submitting that cancellation form. Another thing that we've done prior to this strategy of using the cancellation form, Paul, is we would send out emails once a quarter to all of our customers. And it followed the same strategy where if they selected a one through four stars, it would send them to a Google form to allow them to give us a feedback. And for the customers that are angry with us, granted they're few and far between, it almost scratches that itch where they think they're leaving us a bad review. But then for the customers that click five stars, it directs them directly to our Google page. So that's that's a little bit of a, a strategy, I guess you could say, to make sure that you're only getting good reviews on your on your platforms. Okay, and explain a little bit more of your email system. I know you mentioned you you've used Jobber, you've used Copilot, you've used Dapier. Explain like where where where, uh, where are these emails stored at, and how how are you emailing out? your customers, how, how do you kind of do all those email campaigns? Yeah, so for the, for one-off, well, let me word it like this. For Jobber and Copilot, you can send emails directly through the software. I prefer that for easy recall. So if you're sending your emails out through your software and sometimes sending emails out through like your Gmail or your Outlook, whenever somebody has a question like, or if they're concerned about something like, I never said that, it's hard to bounce through different platforms to try to find that email. So ultimately, I like doing all my emails through the CRMs, whether that's Jobber, Service Autopilot, Copilot, whatever it is. Now for email campaigns, we specifically just use our um, uh, CRM as well. I've, I've flirted with the idea of using HubSpot, but I ultimately want the company to be simplified and standardized and I don't wanna add a whole lot of moving pieces. Um, but ultimately, we send out uh, a mass email for upsells and then a mass text message. We strategically use verbiage to make it super personalized to the customer. And we also make it as easy as possible for the customer to buy from us um, by using tags and email links and, and stuff like that. Fantastic. Well, let's get into, unless you have anything else you want to add to the pricing component that somebody who's listening that's doing, you know, year one or two, they're doing 50,000, 100,000, 150,000. They're, they're figuring this thing out. Is there anything else you want to share about pricing uh, with the, the flower bed cleanups or, 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 you know, these jobs that aren't necessarily lawn mowing? Like, ha, ha, do you have anything else you want to add about how to price your services? Yeah. So there's, there's a few different components to pricing, uh, Paul, as you know, but to speaking to the people that are underneath that 250,000 a year mark, you're going to have your labor and your materials. And then that's pretty much it. So on your materials, add a markup to your materials. We do a 50% markup. So if the if a bag of mulch costs, it doesn't cost $10, but if a bag of mulch costs $10, we're charging 15 to the customer. Why? Because I have to go pick up the mulch anyway. It helps me re recover my overhead expenses. Um, we, If it's super busy, like if you're in 
April, May, June in your spring rush and people are asking you to come to their property to prepare an estimate, I add what I call an e-fee to every single estimate. It's not its own line item, it's baked into the price, but it recovers my expense of going to a property even if, um, even if they say yes or no, if I bake in all e-fees to all estimates, I ultimately come out ahead. Um, and then uh, the most expensive part on pricing is going to be your labor. Your labor rate is going to be the most expensive part on your, your pricing. It's going to be the most expensive item on your profit and loss, or at least it should be. Um, if you're starting off and your ultimate goal is to be a, a solo operator, what I'm about to say next doesn't necessarily apply. But if you are a solo operator currently and you want to get to where we are at, where Paul's at, um, price your price your services as if you were already the company you want to be. Because if you're pricing your services based on your overhead expenses currently, you're leaving very little margin to facilitate that growth going forward. Um, I think that would be all I would have left on, on pricing. That's so good. Uh, pretend where you want to be and just, just already set your prices at that point. That, that's absolutely genius. But I want to switch gears to the the employee side of things. Um, it's hard to get somebody to go out in the heat, whether you're in Florida, Georgia, Texas. You know, we're in the hot states, but then we have our friends Brian Fullerton's up there in Michigan, where it's, you know, I'll, I'll have a t-shirt on or no shirt on, and and be watching his Instagram story, and he's got his hoodie on, or Naylor's in his truck, Virginia, with his hoodie, and th those guys have to fight the opposite. They have to fight cold half yeah. the year, and so ain't, it, it's hard to get somebody motivated to go out in the elements whether it's hot or cold and you know work outside back breaking work it's 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 very 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 difficult to, to to find lawn mowing workers or or landscaping fertilizer workers um what have you found who have you found how have you found them and uh, what have you learned about um uh, avoiding attrition and you know keeping them around uh month after month hopefully year after year yeah. Um, ultimately, to, to have one line sum, sum it up is treat people the way that you want to be treated. If you were if you were an employee having to go work out into 110 degree weather, would you like a boss screaming down your neck at the hottest part of the day? Like, let's say 2.30 p.m. Probably not. So what what you need to do is you need to give them the resources to go play the game and just hope that they score a touchdown. And granted, hope is a bad word there, but like you want to make sure that they are trained, equipped and have the correct resources to go accomplish the mission that you're setting out for them. Um, to, to caveat off that or to piggyback off that, you need to focus on having a good culture. And so we do Monday morning meetings. We kind of give everybody knuckles every single day, um, making sure we're talking about how their weekend went, what's the plan for this week. And that way they never feel out of the loop. We talk about financials all the time. So once a month, I tell them where we're at with monthly revenue. That's something that not every company or very few companies would do. And so they kind of feel like they're a part of the family. Uh, we also focus on company events. And so for um, like, we have a semi-pro baseball team right down the road and we bought out a suite for the home opener and brought the whole company there and they, they could brought, brought their family and had drinks and food and we did that. Uh, we're going to Top Golf this uh, this Friday, so we bought out two bays, and we're going to go to Top Golf. And then uh, August thirtieth, we we bought out a suite for a country concert. Just doing stuff like that to make sure that um, they realize that they are honored and valued uh, as not only as workers, but we we treat them as family. Also, when people first come into a lawn care company, they ultimately think it's an entry level job or just something so that they can get by and get to their next position throughout their career. I hate that. I want to create a company where somebody could come here at 18 years old and hang up their boots at 65. And so ultimately my vision, my dream needs to be so big that everybody else can fit within it. And so when we're in the job interview, basically how I attract top talent, Paul, is how would I word it? Hiring is a function of sales. And so I'm trying to sell them on my vision. And right. yeah, and so I'm trying to sell them on my vision where I almost want them to be so disappointed if they don't get a job offer. Like I want it to make it seem like this is an exclusive club that not everybody can get into. And the ones that do get into it are going to retire at 65. And so we we talk about our vision in the in the job in-person job interview process, and we make it very clear 
hey, I'm never going to hire a CEO that hasn't that was once not a technician. Like there will never be somebody that comes in here day one that outranks you. Like you, you have to work your way up through the company and ultimately giving somebody a roadmap to where they understand that this is a career, I think is a huge component as to why we, we have good employee retention. Where did you find these, these guys at? How, how did you get them to the interview? Yeah, so uh, Indeed, we do Indeed ads and then we have a, a pretty thorough automation to weed out people ultimately i have it built out to where somebody could um call our company and I, I built out like an ai answering service where they could say are you guys hiring it takes them through a whole like um job application process and somebody could show up at our front door for an in-person job interview without me ever talking to somebody and so having that allows me to buy back my time and and uh, dedicate it to somewhere else we also give our employees a $150 bonus if they refer somebody to come work for us and if they make it past the training period. And so that way they can be like, if their friends are like, dude, you're making how much mowing lawns and what's, what's changed? I haven't seen you in six months. You're a whole new person. You, you like, you have a different outlook on life. What's changed? And they're like, it's the company that I'm working for. They build us up so much and they give us all the tools and resources to be successful, not only at this company, but in life. And they're like, can I work there? And then they're like, yeah, because I get $150 if you make it past training. And so we we make it very easy for people to, um, you know, apply. We make it very easy for people to get referred out to us. And then we also carry business cards around. So if I'm out getting my oil changed and somebody is just knocking my socks off with customer service, I'll ask them how much they make per hour. And almost always we can beat it. And so I, I give them my card and then they can fill out the job application there. Cool. Walk us through what a morning looks like. I know you mentioned knuckles and, and things like that, but what, wh where does your team meet? What happens those first 15, 30 minutes of the day? Uh, wh what's kind of been your uh, morning success uh, principles? Yeah. So we used to have like myself and, and my business partner, Dylan, we used to like come early in the morning, do all the maintenance, sharpen all the blades. And it was just like, it was just getting too much. Um, so we ultimately developed like a crew leader bonus where they're incentivized to do all that. And basically I'll get here. Um, I'm, I try to get here first in the morning. I'm always the second person though. My, my general manager for my second location always beats me here. Um, but I try to get here first thing in the morning, load up all the trucks. So that what, what time is that? So my, we have, we have a gym down there and my general manager, he's just way more motivated than I am. So he'll get here at like five 45 in the morning, but we have everybody get here at seven in the morning. And I'll probably get here around 6.30 and, uh, and help load up all the trucks. And then um, I try to get them out the door at 7. So they clock in at 7. Their truck's already in drive at 7. And then we make the crew leaders fill up all the trucks, all the mowers the night prior with gas. So they can be on their first property at 7, 10 in the morning. Yeah, that's that's really smart to, to fill up at the end of the day. Do you just go to the local gas station or, or where do you get your uh, fuel at? Yep, we have two gas stations um, 100, 100 yards from our shop space. And so depending on which way they need to go out in the morning with traffic, they have two different options to perfectly choose from. Uh, we, If we had our own land, I would definitely look into kind of getting gas in bulk. But since we're just right there and this is not our own land, it's just super easy to have them go to a gas station. But they, they go at the end of the day in the afternoon. Yep, yep. They go on the end of the day. After, oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, within the morning. So we used to have them do it in the mornings. And then within the like last two months, we switched to have them do it in the afternoons. Um, but we, each crew leader gets their own company credit card and then they can go buy gas in the afternoons and then bring the equipment back. Okay. And then um, with your branding, you got a sharp looking shirt on Sam. I like it. Um, and, and I, you know, I'm looking at your website and things like that. What What's kind of been your uh, branding uh, lessons learned or, or have you, you know, branded yourself, um, in physical, you know, out on your customer's yard with your nice shirt on and then online. Yeah. Uh, can you rephrase that question, Paul? Are you, are you saying like, what's the importance of our branding? Yeah. Well, just, just explain a little bit of your journey of branding. Cause you got a great brand now, but like, how, you know, what have you, um, trying to think of how, how to say, I just want you to give us a lesson on branding, but just what has been your, um, mindset and, and practical, like the shirt you're wearing now, your website, your Google business, like what have you done to brand your business there um, in uh, outside of Austin, Texas? 
Yeah, so um, we first started off, like I said, my, my wife's Ford Focus. So it's kind of hard to, to build a company around that. Uh, but I, shortly after that, I bought a Tacoma. And as soon as I put like just a simple decal on the side of my truck, that day alone, I probably had three or four people come up, ask me for work. They all wow. said yes on the spot. And probably with it was like a $300 logo job in my truck. It, it paid for itself within one day. And so that was a light bulb moment for me where it's like branding is important because if you look around, like if you're looking for yellow cars, you're going to see yellow cars, right? So I'm always looking for lawn care companies. If you haven't noticed to the audience, there's a million, we call them Chuck in the trucks. So mm -hmm. you guys have rusted up Chevy Silverado with a push mower in the back and there's all, that's all they are. And then if you really look around, there's very few lawn care companies that actually have nice branding on their trucks. Like you'll see a lot of people with like the magnet on the side, but I'm talking about like nice wrapped trucks. And then ultimately what that goes back to, it goes back to my pricing point is there's two ways to get a yes. You either lower price or you raise the perceived value. And what we do is we, we invest into our brand, which artificially raises that perceived value. And then you have to also focus on brand consistency. And so you need to, your trucks need to have the same color and feel as your website. And then your logo on your trucks need to be the same logo on your Google page. When you're sending out estimates, that same logo needs to be on your estimate. It ultimately, I believe Paul builds credibility and trust throughout the entire sales process from the moment of recognition to the moment of getting their credit card. We're the same company all the way throughout. And, and that's ultimately my journey with Brandon and, and why I think it's so important. That's so good. Well, Sam, I'm, I'm really impressed with your business, man. I, I think it's cool that you've, um, branded it around your, you know, service in the army. And uh, I think that has got to help. I'm sure you have stories of, of folks that have hired you for that reason alone, or just the respect there. Absolutely. So it's, it's a blessing and a curse all at the same, at the same moment. Um, the reason why it's a blessing to your point, Paul, is people want to support veterans. And I actually had a coaching call with a 14 year old kid earlier. He's like, nobody wants me to work for them. I'm like, that's that's BS, man. Everybody would love to support a 14 year old, just like everybody would love to support a veteran. That's like, what makes you unique? And if, if that's mine happens to be a veteran, I'm going to use it. The reason why it's a curse is because it limits. I believe if I ever wanted to sell the company almost needs to be like a veteran buyer. Um, also a lot of our employees who have not served get thanked for their service all the time and it just puts them in a weird spot. And then it also kind of puts the customer off a little bit. So it's like, you're, you're not a veteran, but you're driving this, this truck. And so it's a blessing and a curse. Ultimately we're net positive on, on the, on the branding and the name. Um, but it does limit, you know, our availabilities in terms of exit strategies. Got it. Well, if it, if it comes time to sell your business, you can, uh, I can help you. There, there, there's plenty of, there's plenty of companies out there that are, will buy. If you truly have 420, customers in a you know in a crm with proven work and uh in a dense area and a 26 percent net profit proven you'll you'll get a buyer for sure yeah I want to work with that um that's another podcast for actually i just did a, a podcast about business brokers and selling your business uh, a few weeks ago if you guys are interested in that you can look back at at what you need to know about selling a business um it's something that's I've been doing a lot of helping guys with and a lot of, lot of opportunity out there. But I want to ask you, Sam, if there's anything we're leaving out here. I know we've covered a lot of territory, um, but is there anything that's burning on your heart or a passion of yours that you, you haven't uh, let loose on yet? Um, pretty much my passion is sales. Uh, I've always been, I don't want to say gifted, but I've been like uh, driven towards sales and I just like the art of sales. And so yesterday I was speaking with a few different people about, um, you know, how to, how to close people on the phone. And ultimately uh, it was my general manager sitting in here last night and I'm teaching him how to do follow-up calls and just kind of going through like psychology of selling. Um, I don't know if you, you want me to like dive into that at all, Paul. Sure. But that's like, okay. Yeah. So I have, um, I have uh, 19 minutes. I have a uh, call at the top of the hour, but as long as you can keep it under 19 minutes, let it rip. I, sh I sure hope I can keep it under 19 uh, ultimately I don't like people, I don't like to view myself as a salesperson. I like to view myself like as an advisor because 
the people that I'm calling, I didn't buy their contact and they're not, a, they're not, um, they are expecting my call, right? Because they're asking me for pricing. They're expecting me to get in contact with them. And so my general manager was getting nervous because he's like never done sales. He's like, sales is kind of like slimy, but, but you're not selling anything. You're got, you're guiding them through an estimate that they asked for. Like you're not selling. And then ultimately it comes down to um, how you word things. And so I told our general manager that specifically for us, we have two pain points, two sticking points within a call. You first, you need to get the customer to say yes, and then you got to get their card information. And so those are the two sticking points throughout every single call. And so I told my general manager, you need to somehow get the, the customer to say yes before you even ever talk about pricing. He's like, that's impossible. I said, give me a call. Give me a phone number. I'll call him right now. And it just so happened that the guy picked up and um, I said, hey, Lawrence, you know, this is Sam with Troops Mowing. You asked us to send you pricing uh, for lawn mowing services yesterday. The beautiful news is I have something that opened up for tomorrow. Would the morning or afternoon work better for you? And he was like, uh, the, the morning would work better. But like, wh what, what's the details? And so like I'm putting the guy on mute. I'm like, he already said yes. And I haven't even talked about price. Unmute. And then I go over all the details. And then um, I was like, basically, all of our customers require a card on file. We'll get that invoice charged to your card for the agreed upon amount within 24 hours of service completion. We take debit or credit. Which would it, which would it be for you? And so I'm not even asking them for their card information. I'm just already assuming the close or the sale. And I'm assuming that they're just going to give me their card information because it is a requirement, but I make it super frictionless for the, for the customer. Um, another approach that I like to take is I like to just basically be like, Hey, you asked for pricing. I sent you an estimate. I'm calling to get your spot reserved on our schedule. What day this week works best for you? Like, I'm not even asking if they want to get on our schedule. I'm telling them I'm putting you on the schedule. You just tell me the day. And so if you can rephrase it to where it's like you're just talking to somebody you've talked to for years, um, it takes the pressure of sales out of it quite a bit. And I, that's just seemed to be a gold mine for us is wording it those few ways. That's very, very insightful, Sam. Get them, get them to say yes before you get that card. That's, that's smooth, man. Yeah. Very, very good. Well, is there anything else uh, we're leaving out here that, that you want to, mention and again a lot a lot of guys listening aren't at your million dollar mark M most of them are you know below 250 and they're just trying to get all these foundational pieces in place um but is there anything else you want to share yeah i just want to i want to build up those business owners and just honor them and condemn them for you know what they're what they're going through Two hundred fifty thousand a year and less is not an easy spot to be in uh you're you're wearing every single hat in your business you're coming home physically and emotionally exhausted. It's a very tough spot to be in, uh, but ultimately what you are doing is you are laying the foundation for your future. And so you can easily, at a 250,000 a year company, you probably have one or two employees and you're probably in a world of hurt because you don't have culture, you don't have systems, you don't have anything. You just, you own a job and you own coworkers. That's all you have. Um, people either revert back to 100,000 a year where they're solo and they only have to rely on themselves or they push through to that 500,000 a year mark. And if you're already at that 250, you are halfway there, you are just 10,000 door hangers away and another truck to getting to that 500,000 a year mark. And so I just want to encourage you guys, letting you know every single person that's owned a 250,000 a year lawn care company is going through the same struggles, same headaches, same hurdles that you are going through. You are not alone. There's people like Paul you can reach out to, he said brian's law and maintenance people like them i would love to help people out um you are not alone and you are going to get through these this uh this headache that you're currently going through um it's kind of kind of all i would have paul and the last thing i would have for you is i i want to commend you for for your consistency i i was doing some research and it, it looks like you had um 1225 episodes over six years and if we break that down that's 1.78 episodes consistently or one episode every 1.78 days consistently over six years and so i want to commend you as well paul for um it, it's easy to be consistent in the short term but not in the long term and so that says a lot about your character and i want to just honor you for that as well 
Cool. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, consistency is key. I, I'm trying to tell myself that on my, I've been going to this bike class and uh, you ride the bike for 45 minutes. I've gone, I think 20, 23 or 24 times, but it's crazy in our life. We can be consistent in one area and be like, Oh, of course. And then in a whole other area, you're, you're a, it's like, Oh man, I, my belly's flopping around. I need yeah. to, I need to talk to your guy that's showing up at the gym at five 45 every morning. Come give me a pep talk. Seriously. Seriously, but yeah, that's, I go ahead. I was going to say, how can people get in touch with you or follow you online? Or you mentioned you do coaching. If somebody wanted to, to touch base with you, Sam, uh, how, how do they do so? Yeah, so my personal email, sam at troopsmowing.com. Um, and then I have a YouTube channel. I believe it's the Sam Gustin. That's G U S T I N. Uh, you can click subscribe there, and there's links like in each video about my email. Uh, that would be the best way to get a hold of me. I don't do um, Instagram or Snapchat or none of that because it's too much trouble on there. So I stay away from that. Try to keep my eyes on my wife and, and God. And uh, and so, yeah, email, YouTube, the ways you can get a hold of me. Cool. I, I really appreciate your time, Sam. And uh, you guys are absolutely crushing it. And uh, is there any final, like uh, Jerry Springer used to have something called, uh, like the final word or whatever. Do you have any final words? Uh, all I got is to say is Jesus loves you. Put your eyes on Jesus and he'll he'll guide you through life. And so uh, that's that would be my final words that I have for everybody listening. Amen.